This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Zion United Church of Christ here in Union, Missouri. Uh, VBS is happening this week. I don't know if you could tell. Thanks to Mandy and Alicia and to all of the volunteers who have stepped up to make this next week uh, a great and wonderful experience for our kids who are coming up. We've got about 25 kids registered and it's going to be a fun, exciting week. Um, and so, yeah, it's lovely. And I just want to invite you to not only you can come up and take a closer look up here, but also in our Sunday school wing, um, we've got the lights on back there and there's more decorations for this uh, VBS uh, week going forward. So take a peek after service there as well. Um, and before I get to the rest of the announcements, I just want to take us, give us a moment to pause um, because I want to give you an actual, a special update um, in my life. Um, my sycamore is shedding. <laughs> yeah, you might not think it's that uh, important or that exciting, but for me, it's a great point in the season, in the year, that reminds me um, that there are parts and aspects of my life that served me well in the past. But as the summer heats up, it's nice to shed some of those layers that are no longer serving me in this season of my life. And so we're in this kind of point in this summer as if it's starting to heat up. And obviously, like maybe you're not going to be wearing as many layers anymore. But it's also just a good reminder that as the summer growth comes, that we all grow and we all change. And it's a great opportunity in our lives to slow down and to simply thank those kind of that former uh, layers of protection and service that gave us uh, strength and warmth in seasons past, but simply no longer service. So we can thank them for their time that they are with us as we grow into whatever God is leading us into in this time and place. And so I think it's just a beautiful reminder in my yearly calendar that when the sycamore starts to shed its bark, that it's a good opportunity for me to consider those aspects of my life that no longer serve me, that I need to maybe grow into something new. It's a great season of discernment and direction. So I invite you to consider that this morning um, as we get ready to worship God. Similarly, uh, as we get to ready to do all these other kinds of things, like I said, VBS is happening this week. Um, and that concludes on Saturday from, was it, is it 10 or is it 11? Eleven. Eleven to two at Camp Moval. Everybody is invited to the pool party. Okay, so everybody is invited. It's a great time. It's a great pool. The pool is fixed this past year, so it won't be that cold. Because last year there was a crack in it, and they had to refill it all the time. The crack's been fixed. It's not going to be super cold. You should come. It's going to be fun. So pool party, um, hot dogs and drinks will be provided. Bring a snack, bring a side to share. It'll be a wonderful time. It'll be hot. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. Um, so that will, that's an all pool party event, um, or all church pool party event. So show up to that. Um, and then also um, next Sunday, immediately following the service, is a special congregational meeting, specifically going over the tuck pointing bid that we received as part of our comprehensive um, plan to shore up um, what's happening in the fellowship hall. So we've been noticing some of the moisture getting in and trying to make sure that that is watertight water sealing. And one of the first steps is making sure that, the, that we're not having water come into the building. So tuck pointing is the first step. We'll have some people here from our properties committee to answer any questions and to present that bid. Um, so please stick around next week. Um, be prepared to stick around next week for a few minutes. Hopefully it won't take that long, but if it does, that's what we're here for, to do the work of the church. So please stick around for that meeting so that we can make a good faith decision as a congregation um, about how we operate this church and this building. Um, so please consider making sure that you have time and your schedule to come and join us for that congregational meeting next week. And other than that, uh, newsletter articles are due this week. So other, other than that, you've got more announcements in your bulletin. Um, but it is time to worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus challenges us in today's gospel. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then Jesus took a little child and put it among them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes me, not me, but the one who sent me. We are still learning today what Jesus came to teach us 2,000 years ago. To challenge the world, we must change the way we love and welcome all children. May we learn to love all children as if they were our own. Let us pray. Dear God, Jesus has called us to welcome children as a way to welcome you. Teach us the way to make the last first and to be servants of all. Guide us in your way of humility and service. Show us how to become disciples of Jesus Christ, your child and our brother. We ask for blessings on all your children in our holy family. Amen. The first reading of scripture is from Psalm chapter 127, taken from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives sleep to his beloved. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn number 72.
please be seated. As we prepare our hearts and minds for our confession, in a moment of silence, let us think about all the children in our own lives, our community's lives, and in our world, that, and in our world. What are their needs? Where do we fail them as individuals and community and welcome, nurture, and care for them? Please join me in a moment of silent prayer. And please join me in praying our prayer of confession. Dear God, we often have not welcomed the children as Jesus has commanded. Too many children in our community and world suffer from violence, abuse, neglect, and poverty. We know that if we were to join together to welcome and care, to celebrate and honor our children, we would save ourselves and our world. We need forgiveness. We want to make amends. We want to change. We want to learn to welcome all children. For in loving and caring for them, we welcome your reign of justice and peace. Amen. We give thanks for our Savior and teacher, Jesus Christ, who was born among us as a child needing nurture and care, and grew to reveal your power to make all things new. We give thanks and rejoice that in Christ we are forgiven and given strength to grow in discipleship. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, it is time to give God our thanks and praise as we bless and dedicate our gifts that we are giving this day. We continue to be thankful and grateful for all of those who have continued to contribute financially to this congregation over the years, and we are so grateful that we can continue to do mission and ministry here in this place and in our wider community. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as we sing the doxology. God, you who have given us life, you who have made every child a holy child, we give you thanks. May we open our hearts now and give generously to you and to your church for the sake of the children who are our future. Amen. You may be seated. Continue to walk along Mark's gospel. We have gotten to, to the towards the end of chapter nine. So now we are closing up chapter nine this week with Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter nine, verses thirty through fifty. From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. This was because he was teaching his disciples: the human one will be delivered into human hands; they will kill him. Three days after he is killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. They entered Capernaum. When they had come into a house, he asked them, What were you arguing about during the journey? They didn't respond, since on the way they had been debating with each other about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child placed him among the twelve, and embraced him. Then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone throwing demons out in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Jesus replied, Don't stop him. No one who does powerful acts in my name can quickly turn around and curse me. Whoever isn't against us is for us. 
I assure you that whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will certainly be rewarded. As for anyone who causes these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their neck and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter into life, crippled than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell, which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to be thrown into hell with two. That's a place where worms don't die and the fire never goes out. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Maintain salt among yourselves and keep peace with each other. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in the Lord built house unless the Lord builds the house the builders labor in vain. Don't want to live in a man built house with a structure built on sin. Brightly painted shutters and doors and all decay within. I want to live in a Lord built house. Want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house unless the Lord builds the house the builders labor in vain. Don't want to live in a man built house with a man made light inside. Storm blows in and the power goes out and the man in fear must hide. I want to live in a Lord built house. Want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house. I want to live in a Lord built house unless the Lord builds the house the builders labor in vain. I want to live in a Lord built house with a structure built on love, with a rock foundation under me and the heavenly father above i want to live in a lord built house want to live in a lord built house i want to live in a lord built house i want to live in a lord built house i want to live in a lord built house unless the lord builds the house the builders labor in vain i want to live in a lord built house want to live in a lord built house Please join me in a spirit of prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When Jesus reaches out and places a child among the disciples, Jesus is doing so with a Palestinian child. Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. Jesus grew up in Roman-occupied Palestine. It was a geographical region with a mix of cultures, religions, and political aspirations. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew, as much as I am a Midwestern Christian. Under Roman authority as a poor nomadic Jew who had left his family behind, Jesus would have no protection from the empire. He would have no familial protection as being a member of a household. He was not a Roman citizen. 
As a Jew traveling through predominantly Jewish communities, Jesus was intimately familiar with his religious heritage, citing scripture and speaking with authority. Most of the people Jesus interacted with carried with them not only a mix of cultures, but the burden of colonialism and violence in the face of empire. It's impossible for me not to consider the horror in Gaza when reading the story of Jesus holding a child. He would have been intimately familiar with both of these worlds, and I'm sure his heart is breaking to this day. The hostages and the killing of civilians, particularly children, is sinful. I don't know how lasting peace can be solved in Israel and Palestine. And I know this is not the only place in our world desperate for peace, justice, and hope. From Sudan to asylum seekers at our southern border, or the 20 names that will be read this month in Newtown High School as seniors will graduate without some of their classmates from Sandy Hook Elementary School. We know the world is hurting, and kids oftentimes are hurting the most. Wendell Berry once wrote, to be sane in a mad time is bad for the brain and worse for the heart. So if you feel a little mad right now, a little insane right now, might be a good thing for your heart to break when there is so much grief, pain, and death that surrounds us. As we follow the way of Jesus through today's story, we hold close to the hope in his teachings, his way, and his love. Following the transfiguration, Jesus regroups with the other disciples before casting out the last demon in the Gospel of Mark, bringing us to today's Gospel. As Jesus and his disciples travel through Galilee, only this time, Jesus doesn't want anyone to know. Word had gotten out and he wanted some more opportunities to speak privately with his disciples. And everywhere Jesus shows up, crowds would swarm him. So the only quiet place was while he was traveling on the road. Jesus wanted the discretion of the road, specifically so to him, for him to explain again what he's been talking about, about this whole human one thing, about him being the Messiah and what that means. For Jesus, the kingdom of God makes its way through death to new life, both literally in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and all the ways we must die to the death-dealing ways of this world. Not understanding him and too afraid to ask, as they continued on the road, the disciples started arguing among themselves about who among them was the greatest. Reaching Capernaum, Jesus asks them, what are they arguing about? The disciples were silent. They didn't answer. Too embarrassed, perhaps. They didn't answer, but Jesus already knew what they were discussing. Jesus probably overheard them on the road let them argue, and once they had nothing left to say, he asked a question that cut through all of the static. Responding to their debate over who is the greatest, Jesus gives us two answers. The first is, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. The second is when Jesus takes a child from among them and tells them that when you welcome this child, you welcome him, and not only him, but the one who sent him. This twofold answer reinforces one another. When using a child as an example or a kind of physical parable in a word, in a sense, let's not jump too quickly to any idealized notion of childhood. When talking about greatness, Jesus uses a child as the model of the least, the last, and the overlooked. When talking about greatness, Jesus is making a clear point to make somebody who is the least great in his society. He's making a pointed statement, picking out the lowest of the low in society. In this moment, Jesus is making a radical statement by placing immeasurable value on someone who is otherwise expendable. In response to Jesus' declaration of welcoming a child, John and his disciples, one of the select three who was up on the mountain during the transfiguration, decided to not let up. John goes on to say that I still want a little bit of privilege, Jesus. I still want to be, know who's great. John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone throwing out demons in your name, 
And we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. He wasn't following me. He wasn't doing what I told him to do. Jesus replied, don't stop him. No one who does powerful acts in my name can quickly turn around and curse me. John still doesn't get it. He is still caught up thinking about who is the greatest, who has authority, about who is in and who is out. Jesus' correction of John is powerful. Jesus not only supports and affirms others in doing ministry outside of the Jesus movement, but John wants his followers of his own. He wants a special hierarchy of believers about who is first in the kingdom of God. He wants some structure and some authority and some power. But Jesus rejects any attempt to stop the progress of justice, peace, and mercy. No matter the source, Jesus doubled down, doubles down on this idea, insisting that John's thinking is not just wrong, but evil for followers of the way. Causing others to stumble and getting in the way of goodness, justice, love, and peace is the worst thing you can do. From here, Jesus says that it would be better to have a large stone or a millstone, as some sources say, tied around your neck and thrown into a lake rather than causing someone to stumble or fall into sin. And I didn't think about this uh, when we were setting up for VBS, um, because this underwater scene is not what I think Jesus had in mind on this Sunday when Jesus is talking about taking a rock and tying it to your neck and throwing yourself in the lake. I wasn't making this a, a certain point. It's just convenient that way. And so after talking about throwing yourself into a lake, uh, Jesus goes on to start talking about self-mutilation. Now, let's not get too lost in hyperbole, but let's not dismiss the hyperbole either and try to understand what Jesus is getting at. And I'll also say that I think that in an updated version of this, it would be nice not to use some of the ableist language around being crippled and lame, and that would be nice, um, but that's a sermon for a different time, and I've done that before. Jesus said, it's better for you to enter into life crippled than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell, which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to be thrown into hell with two. It seems harsh, but what is Jesus getting at? There are two keys to unlocking this little passage. Not what is he talking about, but when is he talking about? What time period? It's right now. Twice he says, it's better for you to enter into life, not life after death, to enter into life, into the fullness of this life, right now. And the third time he speaks about entering God's kingdom, but from the beginning of chapter one, when does Jesus say the kingdom of God is? It's here, it has arrived, it is at hand. So let's not start thinking about that Jesus is talking about some other time and place as if your eyes and your hands and your feet that are causing you to fall into sin are preventing you from something that happens after this life and this world. No, Jesus is very specifically talking about our life, our community here and now. Jesus is making an important claim. God's kingdom, entering into the fullness of this life, as Jesus puts, us, puts it, is available to us right now. If you think about your eyes or your hands or your feet, these are common metaphors throughout the Hebrew scriptures about how we perceive the world, how we serve the world, the paths we walk as we see, perceive and serve the world. Seeing others as less than you prevents you from experiencing the fullness of this life right here and now. Not serving others, not treating people as you ought to, because of how you view them, how you perceive them as something other than a beloved child of God, gets in your way of experiencing the fullness of the kingdom of God right here and now. And the second key, right, last week I said that was the last time we were talking about demons and that you should be relieved, and now we're gonna talk about hell for a minute. Um, so I don't know if you're super excited about that, but specifically, hell in this sense is quite literal. The word that's used in the Greek is Gehenna, and Gehenna isn't a Greek word. It's a transliteration of a Hebrew word, 
specifically referring to Gai Hinnom, which means the Valley of Hinnom. And Hinnom is Hebrew for wailing, like profoundly crying. And why is this valley for crying uh, named this way? Well, a couple hundred years before Jesus, King Manasseh undid the reforms of his father and brought in worship of foreign gods into the city of Jerusalem and into Judea. And one of King Manasseh's favorite foreign gods was a god named Molech. And Molech liked child sacrifice, specifically through fire. And there was a shrine dedicated to Moloch and to his sacrificial system in a valley on the southeast side of Jerusalem, which is now named Gehinnom, Gehenna. It is a physical place where child sacrifice through fire was happening. Jesus is making a reference to a specific way in which kings of the past undid their paths of following God and started following foreign gods. Hence the valley of wailing. Prophets of old like Isaiah and Jeremiah would condemn King Manasseh and other kings who followed this path that strayed from God's way. And they warned that this evil would bring more evil upon themselves. Hell has always been what we make it to be. Unless the Lord builds the house, its laborers, laborers labor in vain. Hell is a product of the sin of our lives, both individually and collectively, coming home to roost, not in some other life, but right here and now. And it starts, according to Jesus, by thinking that we are better than others, that some people bear the image of God more clearly than others, that some people might not actually carry the spark of the divine. By figuring out who is the greatest, by stopping good things from happening because we don't like who did it, not what they're doing. Jesus insists again and again as he announces his kingdom that leaving behind the ways of prejudice and privilege, the paths to leading us to think that others are less than us, get in the way of us stepping into the fullness of this life or entering God's kingdom right here and now. Or in other words, another good point, Anne Lamont says, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. So we must be careful with who we hate because I'm gonna kinda guess that it's somebody Jesus loves. Following in the way of Jesus was not simply about recognizing him as the Christ but engaging in the world in such a way that challenged conventions, upset norms, and demanded justice, righteousness, and peace in this world, right here and now. Before the term Christian ever took hold of people's theological imaginations, the early church was known as followers of the way. Following Jesus has never been about identity. It has always been about service. By following Christ, we learn that there is always time to slow down because relationship is more important than being greater. By following Christ on his way, we learn that greatness is found in vulnerability, humility, truthfulness, faithfulness, and sometimes it means asking the right questions. When we tend to, when we tend to the needs of justice, righteousness, and peace, we learn the kingdom of God comes near. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' mission his message and his ministry were never really about himself or about who he was. Instead, he was always focused on proclaiming that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, has arrived, that it has come near, that it is available to each and every one of us. Through a rejection of power and privilege, Jesus announced that what he was doing would turn the kingdoms and empires of this world upside down. And when God became flesh and lived among us, we learned the true value of greatness and solidarity, especially with the least, the last, and the lonely. Considering the child that Jesus placed before his disciples as a congregation, as followers of Christ, we have an obligation to children. We, have a, we are called to welcome all children 
everywhere in Jesus' name. And Jesus takes this further, not simply children who are young, but all children of God, and in particular the child of God, who you think is beneath you, that you think is less than you, who you think is not as great as you. But let's just focus on children for a moment, because sometimes we can get too caught up in a wider picture and forget about the good that is ours to do in the places we are called to do it. What does it mean for us as individuals, as a church, as a community, to care for children? What do children need in this moment in time? From their families, from their churches, from their community and their world. Are we doing our part to be preparing kids for the world as it is or what it could be? Children are among the most vulnerable in our society. 13 million children in this country do not know where their next meal is coming from. 800,000 kids this year will be abused. And we can recognize that there's going to be increases of this when the national average for child care is $10,600 per child per year. And so families who are already struggling to pay the bills, keeping a roof over their head and food on their tables, are also trying to figure out how to do work while spending out $10,000 per child for care. In the face of artificial intelligence, the cost of living, sickness, gun violence, climate change, and an unraveling of our social connections, I do not envy children trying to figure out who they are in 2024. But things don't have to be this way. According to the Child's Defense Fund, investing in programs like Head Start and early childhood education can positively impact future economic in educational attainment, employment, and health. Economic research suggests that for every one dollar spent on early education, the return on investments ranges from four dollars to thirteen. A robust long-term investment is essential to ensure high quality early care and learning opportunities are accessible to the children and families that need them the most. And it's not just early childhood care that is important. When we take care of kids, truly take care of them as if they were our own, as if they were actually us, the world would be a truly better place and we would all benefit from it. And the same goes for all of our marginalized communities. It may take some work, it may be hard, but when we care for one another, we do the good that is ours to do, we can remember that we all need a little help. And so sometimes it's simply taking care of children. Sometimes it's making sure that our communities are a little bit safer. Maybe it's making sure that you look at pedestrians crossing the street and who are there when you're driving. It's as simple as that at times, about doing that good that is yours to do, to make sure that places like Union or places like this congregation are safe and welcoming places for kids not only to live but to thrive, to be valued as the beloved child of God that they are, the Reverend Peter Ryable, a Unitarian minister, was inspired by Deuteronomy 6 and once spoke about the power of community, solidarity, and our mutual dependence. And he has this little poem where he says, we build on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. We profit from persons we did not know. This is as it should be. Together we are more than any one person could be. Together we can build across the generations. Together we can renew our hope and faith in, in the life that is yet to unfold. Together we can heed the call to a ministry of care and justice. We are ever bound to in community. May it always be so. When the world gets crazy, when your heart breaks at the news, when it seems like it is too much, this is when it's time to lean in, to lean into community, to step up, to find ways to volunteer, to reach out, to support programs that are happening to protect and to care for those communities. 
Find people who are already doing the work because as much as headlines talk about despair and hopelessness, in every corner of this country and this world, people are making sure that people are fed, making sure people have a place to stay, making sure people feel safe, free, and loved. There are people doing the good work and they just might not make the headlines. And so when the world feels too much, that is actually the time not to check out, but to check in, to double down on caring for one another. It's my only antidote to despair. It's about showing up at things like VBS. It's about going and supporting backpack programs. It's about making sure that the communities are safe. It's about advocating for people who need our help. That is actually the precise time that it makes you feel as though this world is worth fighting for. And that when we continue to see each other and all people as God's beloved children, dwelling with the Spirit of God within each and every one of them. When we lean into care and service, the world doesn't seem so hopeless, it doesn't seem so helpless, and it might get better, even just a little bit. And so, we are ever bound in community. May it always be so. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the way in which our communities have been bound together. We know, O oh God, that it's not always been easy, that our pettiness at times, we can be irritable and rude, we can be selfish, we can be simply tired and worn down, not as quick to love and offer support as we should. Forgive us for the times that we have come short, for the times we could have done something and chose not to do anything. Help us to continue to follow in your way. Help us to shed all of those things that are no longer in service of us this day. As we gather in your name, remind us that we need one another, that we always have, that we always will. Remind us that there is so much love to go around, that it's a limitless resource, that we can continue to show up with grace-filled hope, optimism, peace, and love, Help to encourage us to do the good that is ours to do, to be the people you need us to be right here in our community. We might not always be able to change the whole world, but we have the power to do something here in our community, in our lives, in our spheres of influence. May that be enough if we are courageous enough to address them, to serve them, to help them. God, we give you thanks for all of those people, not only in this congregation, but in our wider community that are already doing the good work that you have called them to do, that are helping and feeding and sheltering, they're dedicating their time, their talent, their treasure to the ongoing work of your justice and peace here in this place. We give you so much thanks that people have always been dedicated to your task of love and solidarity. So God, we also know that there's so much more to do and so we pray for this world, for all those who live within it, for all those who need your care and protection, for all those who need your safety and justice, mercy, and peace. We pray for communities around the world. The communities near and far, communities we will never know, the communities that we call home. We pray for the community that we call home, for the places that are nearest and dearest to our hearts. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for the strangers who cross our paths. We just pray for our enemies and for all of those we think are beneath us. We pray for our families and for our loved ones, for those nearest and dearest to our hearts who need your help, who need your peace, who need your healing, who need your grace. And finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves, for all of those prayers that lay heavy on our hearts. Hope that you would help Grant us the courage and the wisdom, the perseverance, 
and the love that we need in this moment to be all that you call us to be. And although we don't always know where we're going, oh God, we do know who we're following. And so we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing hymn number 719, Go My Children With My Blessing. Hymn number 719. bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, knowing that there is nothing you can do, neither heights nor depths, nor things in the past, nor things to come, nor life, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation that will ever be able to separate you from the love of God which we have come to know in Jesus the Christ. Go in peace this day and always. Amen and amen. amen.